Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of RNM Zubich my system my apologies for the delay in this video but we recently had some torrential rains here in Karachi which affected a lot of things including electricity running water and internet services the customary quote don't judge each day by the harvest you reap but by the seeds that you plant from the scottish novelist poet and travel writer robert louis stevenson a brief review of the last part where we finished chapter number 7 the pin after continuing the discussion regarding the problem of unpinning with illustrations given by nemzovich and then also went through games number 16 17 and 18 of the illustrative game section of the book as advised by nemzovich <clears throat> so now moving further into the book we begin chapter 8 discover check nemzovich remarks on the chapter as being short but rich in dramatic complications he begins with a discussion under the following heading the degree of relationship between the pin and the discovered chick is more closely defined where should the piece which discovers the chick move to the position on board gives a clear picture of the degree of relationship between the pin and discovered chick and we see from it that the pin piece tired of eternal persecution has changed their color this change has had the effect of transforming the once sickly youth into a doughty warrior and so we can describe a discovered chick as a pin in which the pin piece has passed over with colors flying into the enemy camp further in the discovered chick as in the pin we have to do with three actors namely number 1 the piece threatening a chick which is now masked by one of their own fellows number 2 the masking piece number 3 the piece standing behind the masking piece or more shortly number 1 the threatening piece number 2 the masking piece number 3 the threatened piece but whereas in the pin the immobility of the pin masking piece is the source of all their troubles in the discovered chick the masking piece enjoys quite uncanny mobility any and every square within their reach is open to them they can even seize a point subject to multiple enemy attacks for their opponent being in chick cannot touch them If we examine the possible moves open to such a masking piece we find that the masking piece can do three things point a they can take anything within their reach with impunity since the enemy cannot recapture the masking piece point b they can attack any major piece not letting themselves for one moment be disturbed by the thought that the square on which they so hotly alight by right belongs to the enemy that is to say one which is under a heavy enemy fire point c they can exchange their square for another one if for any reason this appears more favorable to them than the one they have left thus in the position on board point a could be carried out by rook takes on a5 discovered check or rook takes on h5 discovered check notice that the rook can make either capture quite fearlessly if the rook chooses to follow the course outlined in point b they will play rook e5 check or rook d3 check while we find point c followed if they feel the reproach that their bishop 
is pinned a fact which dulls their lordships usually healthy appetite and we have rook d1 check black king any move bishop takes on e3 and so on the point c group has naturally a very wide range but no purpose would be served by further elaboration for the reasons why a piece is more effectively placed here than there are many fold we may refer however to yet another example in the following section and nemzovich begins the next section with the following heading the seesaw the long range masking piece can move to any square in their line of motion without spending a tempo that is to say wholly gratis free or without any charge nemzovich writes in the position on board right side white plays bishop h7 check whereupon the black king has only one move king h8 and now the terrible weapon concealed in the discovered check is revealed if white now plays bishop b1 check black with king g8 escapes the discovered check but with bishop h7 check white beckons them back again to the fatal square since the black king has but this one move at his disposal and only has this because the bishop by bishop h7 check has masked the attack of the threatening piece this stalemate position which we have described gives us thus a kind of seesaw with the great advantage that the masking piece can occupy any square in the line of their withdrawal here the diagonal h7 to b1 without the maneuver costing them a tempo for white again has the move in actual play the seesaws lead to richly comic effects whose humor however does not appeal to the losing player the seesaw can be the cause of frightful devastation in the position on board the game would proceed bishop h7 check king h8 bishop takes on f5 check king g8 bishop h7 check king h8 bishop takes on e4 check king g8 bishop h7 check king h8 bishop takes on d3 check king g8 bishop h7 check king h8 bishop takes on c2 check king g8 bishop h7 check king h8 bishop takes on b1 check king g8 and now white gives back of their superfluity or excess in material somewhat like a usurer who has grown very rich and in their old age at small outlay turns benefactor so rook g6 check f takes on g6 bishop takes on a2 check and mate next move the bishop has eaten their way to b1 in order after the preparatory rook sacrifice to seize the diagonal a2 to g8 a similar but finer picture is shown in the position on board here the problem is to entice black's bishop at d5 from the defense of the f7 pawn and this will be done by bishop h7 check king h8 and bishop c2 check the better place in the sense of point c as discussed previously king g8 rook g2 check bishop takes on g2 and now again bishop h7 check king h8 bishop g6 check king g8 queen h7 check king f8 and queen takes on f7 mate
Moving further, Nimzovic gives another example of the seesaw from a game. Carlos Torre Repeto vs Emmanuel Lasker played in 1925 in the Moscow tournament in Moscow, USSR. Torre was a Mexican chess grandmaster and this game is one of his memorable victories where he defeated former world chess champion Emmanuel Lasker with a queen sacrifice following the so-called windmill chicks or as quoted by Nimzovich in my system, the seesaw. Nimzovich writes, Another example of the seesaw is seen in the game Position on Board, which Torre won against Lasker. In this threatening position, his rook at e1 is directly and his bishop at g5 indirectly attacked. Torre hit upon the move b4. There followed queen f5. Not queen takes on b4 because of rook b1. Better than the text move would however have been queen d5. But queen f5 was played by Lasker in the game and play continued with rook g3, h6 and knight c4. This intervention of the knight would have been impossible had the black queen been at d5. Queen d5 and knight e3. Torre fights like a lion to break the pin. But without a point for his bishop to fall back upon, he could not have succeeded. Queen b5 and bishop f6. That this might have real effect, it was necessary to entice the black queen to an unprotected square, which was the object of knight e3. Queen takes on h5, rook takes on g7 check, king h8, and now we have a seesaw. Rook takes on f7 check, king g8, rook g7 check, king h8, rook takes on b7 check, king g8, rook g7 check, king h8, rook g5 check, king h7, rook takes on h5, king g6, rook h3, king takes on f6, rook takes on h6 check, and white wins. <clears throat> Moving further, Ninzovich discusses regarding the double check with the following heading. Double check is brought about by the masking piece also giving check. <clears throat> The effectiveness of a double check lies in the fact that of the three possible parries to a check, two are negatory or have no value, namely the capture of the piece giving check and the interposition of a piece. Flight is the one and only resource. Consider the position on board. Here the choice lies between queen h7 check and queen h8 check. The former yields only an ordinary discovered check. Queen h7 check. King takes on h7 and bishop f6 check and allows the parry queen takes on h1 or queen h5. Queen h8 check, however, leads to a double check and these parries are automatically now ruled out. Therefore, queen h8 check, king takes on h8, bishop f6, double check, king g8 and rook h8, checkmate. <clears throat> so again, in the well-known position, as shown on board, white mates in 3, thus, queen h8 check, king takes on h8, knight takes on f7, double check, king g8 and knight h6, 
take mate. The double check is a weapon of a purely tactical nature, but of terrible driving effect. Even the laziest king flees wildly in the face of a double check. We close this chapter with three apposite or relative examples. Number one, in a game played some years ago between Von Bardeleben and Nisnevich, there occurred the amusing position shown on the board. I am assuming Nisnevich is here referring to Kurt Von Bardeleben, who was a German chess master who played around the turn of the 20th century and is best remembered for a game which he lost to former world chess champion Wilhelm Steenitz at Hastings in 1895. I could not find any information on the second player, Nisnevich, nor a record of this game on the internet. Nisnevich continues, White's last move had been Rook B to C7. Obviously not Rook B8 check because of Rook F8 check and Rook takes on B8 to follow. To rook c7, black replied queen takes on c7 and the game was drawn. I subsequently pointed out the following win for black. Rook f1, double check. King takes on f1. Knight g3, check. King e1, queen e3, check. And king d1. Observe the driving effect. The king is already at d1 and only a move or two ago he was sitting snugly at home. Queen e2 check, king c1, queen e1 check, king c2, queen takes on e4 check, king c1, knight e2 check and white wins the white queen and the game. Note that on the double check there was built a line of play which is well known and only strikes us as unusual because it takes place in a diagonal and not as is usual in a file. This line of play, a tactical maneuver, consists in breaking a link in the defense by forcing a third piece between two mutually protecting pieces. In the position under consideration, the king was enticed to c2 between the queen at b1 and the bishop at e4. Moving further, the second example given by Nemzovich is from the game Richard Reti vs. Savali Tartakover, played in Vienna in 1910. Both Richard Reti and Savali Tartakover were prominent chess uh, masters of yesteryear and required no introduction. Nemzovich writes, Number 2. The following well-known little game was played between Reti, White, and Dr. Tartakover, Black. e4, d6, d4, d5, knight c3, d takes on e4, Knight takes on e4, knight f6, and queen d3. A most unnatural move. e5. The rather theatrical gesture of the first player, the move queen d3 has worked. Black has in mind a brilliant refutation of it, but his idea proves impossible of execution. For queen d3 was not as bad as all that. And so white gets the better game. The right move was knight takes on e4 instead of e5. Queen takes on e4 and knight d7 followed by knight f6 with a solid position. But e5 was played by Dr. Tartakover in the game. He takes on e5, queen a5 check. Bishop d2, queen takes on e5, castling long, and knight takes on e4. A mistake. 
he should have played bishop e7 instead so knight takes on e4 queen d8 check king takes on d8 bishop g5 double check king c7 and bishop d8 mate If king e8 instead of king c7, then rook d8 mate. The closing combination is really very pretty. The third example is from a simple game played in Parnau, Estonia, then the Russian Empire where Nimzovich played against someone by the name of Rikov. Likely an amateur player since I could not find any relevant information regarding them on the internet. Nimzovich writes, In December 1910, I gave a simultaneous display in Parnau on the Baltic, <clears throat> on which occasion the following pretty little game was played. White Nimzovich, Black Rikov e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, knight f6, castling, b6, d5, knight takes on e4, d5, a6, bishop d3, and knight f6. Knight e7 instead would have saved the piece for black, but not the game. For instance, bishop takes on e4, f5, bishop d3, e4, rook e1, e takes on d3, or e takes on f3, queen takes on d3, or queen takes on f3 with a strong attack for white. But knight f6 was played by black in the game. d takes on c6 e4, rook e1, d5, and bishop e2. By forcing black to protect his e-pawn, white got time to remove his pieces from the fork unhurt. But instead, he played his bishop to a square, which allowed the capture of the knight. e takes on f3, black sees no danger and unconcernedly pockets the piece. E takes on b7 and bishop takes on d7. If f takes on e2 instead, then simply a takes, uh, b takes on a8 queen for the black e pawn is pinned. As such, b takes on, bishop takes on b7 was played by black. Bishop b5 double check and mate. Alright, uh, we conclude this part of Aranims of its my system here. The chapter on the discovered check also concludes and we shall begin chapter 9, the pawn chain from the next part of the video series. Here is a look at the recent channel support from my Twitch stream. A couple of new supporters, Aaron Gull and Ivan Chess Master. Aaron is a good chess player from the US who streams occasionally as well. Ivan is another chess streamer with a USCF rating of around 1700. I will post a link to both channels in the video description. Do check them out. Thanks a lot for the kind support everyone. Much appreciated. Alright, till next time. Take care.